It is really good to be back at New Hope. I, don't, I can't say that for every place that I go, but it's really true here. Promise. I want to bring you greetings from Dr. Carol Taylor, our president and boss. Uh, my wife is here, Lacey, over here, wave, and uh, my granddaughter, uh, Esther. And so we're just kind of here as a family this time. Is that okay? Yeah. Right. So greetings from Evangel University. And um, uh, if uh, you are at a point in your life, whether a, a uh, parent or a uh, student, and it's decision-making time for the next um, uh, stage of your young lady or young man's life and educational uh, pursuits, then uh, Lacey is going to be in the coffee area, and you're welcome to stop by there and run any questions um, by her that you have. Um, you may know because you watch TV and read newspapers and listen to the radio and stuff like that, that the world of post-secondary education as well as the rest of our culture is kind of in a nosedive right now. And um, I, I'm not exactly sure that it's a good deal to send your kids away to state schools um, where they're going to get whatever they get. Um, we need to, we really need our, our, to send our kids out tooled up, prepared with excellence in their chosen field of study, but also to have a solid foundation in the Word of God to know what they believe and why they believe it. By the way, um, I will be, my wife and I both will be uh, here at five o'clock answering any questions that you might have with respect to the upcoming uh, Israel trip. It's, it's a trip done especially for New Hope. It's coming up in March. Um, and um, it is the kind of experience that changes your life forever. You, I can just assure you, I don't care who you are, I don't care how old you are, I don't care how long you've been a Christian or how many times you've gone to Sunday school, this will change your life forever, forever. And it changes your um, uh, attitude and view toward God because there, faith becomes sight. You literally see biblical reality. There's no more roll of the dice or I'm not sure or maybe that's just legendary or whatever. You see the realities of Scripture, and it changes you. It changes your view of God, and forever it will change how you read the Scriptures. So I want to encourage you to, uh, to be here at 5 o'clock. If you're sitting on the fence, if you have any inclination whatsoever that this might be in your future, we need to talk at 5. This morning I want to uh, uh, bring a message to you from the book of Colossians, chapter 3. So if you'd put a finger there. And then if you've got another spare finger, look for 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Colossians 3, 1 Corinthians 10. And the passages of Scripture that I mentioned will be on the screens behind me, and you're welcome to access those for the exact wording of Scripture or follow along in your own Bibles and maybe make notes, underline things that are of importance. I came across these two passages and one day they just jumped out at me. Some kind of way the Spirit of the Lord put the two together because they're basically parallel passages. There in those two texts, Paul is saying basically the same thing in both. Um, I, this message that I want to share with you today, behind maybe salvation and infilling of the Holy Spirit is, is the most transformative um, truth in scripture that I have ever found. So today we open to you a treasure. In, first, in the, the book of Colossians chapter 3 verse 17, we hear Paul telling the church at Colossae, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do everything that you do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now flip to the other one. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, the second half of the verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Paul there says, whatever you do, do everything that you do to the glory of God, to bring God glory, honor, esteem, reverence, respect, worship, laud, 
everything that you do, do to the glory of God. This, these two passages bring up a couple of questions. Did you notice the inclusive language that Paul used in both of these texts? The whatevers and the everythings and the alls. Did you notice that? So here's my first question. Um, is there anything left out of that circle? Any area of our lives, pumping gas, doing dishes? Evidently not. Paul's drawing a circle around, would you, could you say, all of life, everything, whatever, all done in the name of the Lord Jesus and to the glory of God. Here's another question. Do you notice that these two commands are not given in what we call the pastoral epistles, the letters of First and Second Timothy and Titus that Paul wrote specifically to people that he had trained and then helped put in place and left behind in charge who were pastors. You don't find this in First and Second Timothy and Titus. You find these statements in open letters to entire church bodies, the church at Colossae, First Assembly of God in Corinth. Paul is writing not just to leaders, not just to the elite, not just to the super spiritual, not to those who have been in the Lord for a very long time and are super mature, but he's writing to the entire body of Christ. You know what that means. This is a word of God to you and me today, right? Right in our wheelhouse. Right up in our grill. Here's another question I wanted to ask, and that is, and I think this really gets, begins to get into the background and the meat of what Paul has said here. Where would Paul get such a lofty and such a comprehensive idea of what worship is all about? Such a radical idea of living all of your life, every thought, every word, and every deed, every aspect, every area of our lives as worship to God that is to be done in the name of our Lord Jesus where in the world would that come from? Well, when we start looking at the biography of Paul, the author of both of these texts, one of the things that we find is in Acts chapter 22, where Paul says that he was educated or that he was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. If you read the Erdman's Dictionary of the Bible article on Gamaliel, you'll find that Gamaliel was the co-chair of the Sanhedrin. He was the lead um, uh, authority in the movement that we know of as Pharisaism. As such, he was the most influential and most important Jew alive in that day. In other words, Paul studied at Harvard. He wasn't trained by just by nobodies. He was trained by the very best, the most influential. The reason I know is because I wrote the article. Um, but in, in Acts 23, Paul says uh, the same author of these texts that we're considering this morning he calls himself, he says, brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees. Then in the book of Philippians, he writes this with his own hand. He says, as to the law, I am a Pharisee. And by the way, I want to point out a couple of things. One is that this is long after Paul's salvation that happens in Acts 9. About a, de a decade and a half, almost two decades. Paul is a believer in Jesus and he's still calling himself a Pharisee. So the second thing I wanted to point out is Although we have come to use that word as synonymous with the word hypocrite, oh, he's just being pharisaical. Paul used this to describe himself even after coming to faith in Jesus, after preaching to thousands, founding dozens of churches, writing letters in the New Testament, and eventually dying as a martyr for Jesus in AD 64, we hear that Paul is referring to himself at the very end of his life as a Pharisee. So now the question becomes, well, well, then who were they? And what did they believe? I'd just suggest to you that what we heard in Sunday school, it's because they were not fair, you see, is not exactly getting down to the reality of the matter. The Pharisees were the most respected leaders of the people in Jesus and Paul's day. These were the people who studied the scriptures the most carefully and taught the peoples in the synagogues as well as on the roadside. The Pharisees are responsible for leaving us really important teachings. For example, 
The Pharisees taught the priesthood of all believers, that we're all representatives of God, that God's called all of us to be his spokespersons and his ambassadors, not just some chosen few at the top of, the, uh, of some arbitrary hierarchical pyramid. Another thing that the um, Pharisees taught is that all of life is sacred, not bits and pieces of it, not portions or parts of it, not just Sabbath for them or Sunday for us, not just when you're in the synagogue or when you're in church, not just when you're praying or you're doing your Bible devotions or going to a revival service, but that all of life is sacred and that lived with intentionality that we can have our lives consumed with constant, consistent, strung together acts of worship that glorify God. The rabbis in Jesus' day had even ordained that when you were walking along the road and you saw a beautiful tree, that there was a certain prayer that you prayed that sanctified that moment and get, gave God glory for what you're enjoying visually. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have made such beautiful objects as this tree. Same thing if you saw a beautiful field. Same thing if you saw a beautiful woman. And by the way, that would correct or stand to serve, to serve as a correction for any inappropriate thoughts that you had. Uh, because you're directing your attention off of the created back to the cre creator from which that beauty flows. Praise the Lord, guys. Rabbis of Jesus' day believed that every act, every, every event, every moment of a life stood the possibility of becoming an act of worship to God. One day, in the house of study, that great Rabbi Gamaliel got up in the middle of the lesson and started walking out of the house of study, and his disciples got up and started following behind him, Master, where are you going? They knew that he was going to the latrine. He said, I'm going to worship God. How about that? If it works, you should worship God. So Paul the Pharisee, the disciple of Gamaliel, is reflecting this comprehensive worldview that he'd learned from his Pharisaism and had come to embrace as a guiding principle of his life. He's sharing with us in these texts from the New Testament that all believers should be functioning as holy priests of God, representatives, ambassadors, apostles of God in our workplace, in our home, in our place of, uh, of recreation, and that all of life is sacred, not just in bits and pieces of it. All of life is can be viewed as one big, long, connected string of acts of worship that are done in the name of the Lord Jesus and to the glory of God. In reality, though, it wasn't the Pharisees that came up with these ideas of everybody being a priest and all of life being holy, all of life being sacred, because we hear as far back as the earliest books of the Bible, Moses the great lawgiver says in Exodus 19, it says, and the Lord said to Moses, speak to all of Israel and tell them this. He's not just telling the Levites, not just telling the priests, the sons of, of Aaron. Tell them this, you are my possession among all the peoples in the earth, and all of the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests to me. The whole nation. So this whole idea of, of everybody, of all servants, worshipers of God, being priests, a priesthood of all believers, you can't just blame that on the Pharisees. You can't just blame that on Paul or Peter. You can't just blame that on, on Jesus. You can't just blame that on the Pharisees. This goes back to the very beginning. It was always God's intention. This goes back to Moses, the first author of Scripture. Interestingly enough, it's not uh, unique to Exodus chapter 19 when we read the book of Deuteronomy, also by Moses. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all your soul and with all of your strength, Moses says. Does that sound like legalism to you? Uh-uh. Love the Lord your God with everything inside of you, heart, soul, and strength. In other words, what Moses did is the same thing Paul did. 
He drew the circle around all of life, all of your heart, all your soul, and all of your strength. He amplifies this in the next couple of verses. He says, and you shall speak of these things when you lie down and when you rise up. In other words, all day long, we're to be engaged in the things of God. When you sit in your house and when you walk in the way, these are just biblical ways of saying all the time. The other authors of Scripture, they don't mind getting in on this as well. You hear from the uh, psalmist in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and what does it say? You can cheat if you need to. I'm not looking, go ahead. All that is within me. So what does all mean? Let everything inside of me, everything that makes up me, bless the Lord. Leaving anything outside the circle? Uh Uh-uh. It's not, what the, it's not the way the Bible rolls. It's not the way things are done in God's world. How about Proverbs, the, the, the writer of the wisdom uh, book? Proverbs says, in, um, when we go to church, acknowledge him. When we do our devotions, acknowledge him. Uh, when we're praying the Lord's Prayer, acknowledge him. Maybe when we're giving in the offering, acknowledge him. And then you're good to go. No, it doesn't say that. The writer of the Proverbs is drawing a circle around all of life. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And so we find this very clearly in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, in the Bible of Jesus, Paul, Peter, and and the other apostles. But it was left to those second century B.C. Pharisees to bring these ideas of the priesthood of every believer and the sanctity, the holiness of all of life to the forefront yet again because for some reason between Moses and the second century B.C., most Israelites had lost those emphases in their lives. So they taught the idea that all, of pre- pe- all people are to be representatives of God, all true believers are to be representatives of God, and that we're to live all of life representing God, um, glorifying God with whatever activity that we are engaged in, not just in, during the, when they went to the synagogue or when they went to the temple. Um, and it was this idea, when Christianity comes along, when Jesus is born and his uh, earthly ministry takes place, Jesus, Paul, Peter, and the rest of early Christianity co-opted that whole idea and clicked and dragged it over into first century Christianity. So this is the context in which you should understand when Jesus says, what's the greatest commandment? It's love God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. What is he doing? He's going right back to Moses. He's stirring a circle around all of life, around all true servants of God. What about when Jesus says, even if you give just a cup of cold water in my name, you will not lose your reward. Even giving someone a a, a bit of refreshment has eternal significance, Jesus says. Where does he get that kind of idea? From this world that says we're all priests and we're all supposed to be representing God in our world and our lives are supposed to be lived as one long string of acts of worship that glorify his name. Jesus said this, when we feed, when we clothe, when we visit the sick and the imprisoned, even to the least of these, his brethren, it says doing it to him. Do you see this this thing coming out in Jesus' teaching? He's sanctifying all of life. He's breaking down the barrier between the secular and the sacred. Paul does the same thing. He says, I urge you, brethren, to present your bodies as living sacrifices to God. So everything that's involved in this love God with all of your heart, soul, and strength, your body is to be done as a sacrifice, living sacrifices to God. Do you see him using priestly language there? Who's he using it of? Us. Us. You and me. Average folks. He says in 2 Corinthians, he says that our lives are to be fragrant aromas. And again, that's sacrificial language. That's the smell that goes up off of the altar of a sacrifice, a life lived to God. Likewise, Peter, he says that we are priests and we are supposed to be offering up spiritual sacrifices. And he's talking about our lives. 
And when he's talking about priests, he's not just talking about leadership, not just talking about people ordained or folks that are deacons. He says just a few verses later in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that we are all a chosen race. We are all a royal priesthood, and we are all a holy nation that we, all of us, should be declaring the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his light. In other words, like the Pharisees 200 years before these early Christians and before Jesus, the founder of the movement, early Christians were being taught that they were all priests and they were to live their lives in priestly purity and holiness, godliness that reflected the glory of God to everybody that they had a chance to impact. Their lives were living witnesses and their lives were off being, being, being offered up as holy sacrifices to God. Um, spiritual worship in the everyday. Unfortunately, the church wasn't long able to maintain this, this delicate, precious teaching that was inherited from, from Judaism. And by the Middle Ages, the church had come to make a very clear distinction between secular work and sacred work. The holy orders of priests and, and monks and friars, um, as opposed to the common work of the everyday laborer, um, their work, the priest's work, had eternal significance, supposedly, and the, those that just worked for food and shelter and, cl and, um, and, uh, and clothing, those people just sort of labored just like beasts of burden. Um, their work was temporal, temporary, of, of, of non-spiritual significance, of non-eternal significance. And so a very clear distinction had been made by the Middle Ages between that which was secular and that which was sacred. The sacred included att attendance at mass, um, going through confession, doing penance, praying, um, praying the rosary, uh, partaking of other sacred sacraments, hearing sermons, those things were considered holy activities. But the normal activities of life, like child rearing, like marital relations, like plowing, shoemaking, blacksmithing, these were worldly occupations. Really? Does that sound like the Bible that we've been reading up to this point? But in this way, in this the dynamic, all-inclusive concept of sanctifying all of life and living all of life as worship was lost to the Christian faith. And this was the case for more than a millennium until finally in the late 14, early 1500s, we have an event that's called the Protestant Reformation and leaders like Martin Luther and John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, William Tyndale and others brought this important reality back to the forefront of Christian, Christian living and, and declared the priesthood of all believers and, and that all of life, not just Sunday, but from Sunday all the way until the next Sunday was holy time, holy space, and that people who are true followers, really committed to God, would live their lives uh, in, in purity and in holiness as as priestly representatives of God and living all of life as worship. Unfortunately, today, 500 years later, after the Protestant Reformation, 2,000 years after the teachings of Jesus and the birth of the early church, 2,200 years after the Pharisaic Revolution, we find ourselves once again in danger of losing this really important principle. The voices of the great Pharisaic leaders, the rabbis of Jesus, Paul, Peter, of Luther, Calvin, and others have now grown silent and the clock seems to be moving backward. And we're not moving in the direction of New Testament vibrant Christianity, but we're moving back into the version of Christianity that so marked the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. So the gulf between pastors and laity seems to be broadening all the time. Thank God that's not the case in this church, but it is in many places that I visit. In addition to that, the average everyday Christian, the you's and the me's that make up the kingdom of God, we're again separating, di bifurcating, dichotomizing, chopping up our lives into, well, this is holy time and this is me time. 
This is sacred time, and this is all the rest of the week. This is, this is when I'm on my shekel. So it's not surprising then that when you look at the frequency of how, how frequent people cheat on tests or taxes, plagiarize papers or fudge on time reports, do subpar work, or extend their breaks and their lunchtime, um, that that's happening as often in Christian circles as it is in unbelieving circles. In fact, uh, two major studies, one done by Josh McDowell, another by Eugene Edward Veith, have indicated that incest, domestic violence, divorce, and suicide are as prevalent in the Christian community as, it, as they are in the unbelieving community. And I would say with Paul, brethren, these things should not be. That should not be the case. We were promised abundant life. My question is, in so many people's lives, and you can look around and do your own study, where is it? Where is that abundant life? Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Where is it? We get by. We mark time. We live lives of mediocrity. We uh, get by by the skin of our teeth. This is not what Jesus promised. This is not what he came to bring. Ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest this, that what we believe and what we think about eventually affects what we do and how we live life. That's just the reality of the thing. It is inescapable. Ask the average Christian, could you give me a definition of worship? Most of the time, probably almost 100% of the time, you're going to hear, well, worship is when we gather together corporately, it's usually on Sunday morning, we stand up, we lift our hands, the music is great, and we sing. Wonderful. Have no problem with that. Love every minute of it. But I got some real bad news for you, ladies and gentlemen. That happens for 30 minutes, but the week has 168 hours in it. What that means is if the chief end, the... Westminster Shorter Catechism, one of the great confessional statements that came out of the Protestant Reformation, says, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man, the major reason why man was created is to worship God, to glorify God, and to enjoy Him forever, have that abundant life that comes with worshiping, glorifying God. Um, so my question is, are you willing to go through the rest of your lives where the main purpose for which human beings were created, we are fulfilling only one-third of one percent of the time. All the other time is downtime. All the other 167 and a half hours of the week is just kind of, well, that's on me. It, kind of, it almost makes life pointless, doesn't it? What's the point? So let, let me just ask you this. If we took this thing seriously, if we went back to, the, to first century dynamics, if we were sitting in a church at Colossae and we heard this verse and it rung our bell, if we were sitting in a church in Corinth and 1 Corinthians 10.31b was read and it rung our bell, and you said, you know what? I'm sick and tired of living this life of medioc mediocrity. I'm, I'm tired of living below what Jesus promised me, which was abundant life. I want to know the pathway to it. What would a life look like that was committed to, okay, done with mediocrity. I am a priest of the Most High God, and I will glorify God, and I will do every area of my life as unto the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus and to the glory of God, what would that look like? What would it look like if you started driving your car to the glory of God as a sacrifice of worship, as an act of obedience, as a living sacrifice, like maybe even at rush hour? What do you think? Maybe fewer hand signals? Eh? Maybe, maybe f um, fewer irritated statements thrown at your fellow drivers who can't hear you anyway because their windows are rolled up too. 
maybe a little bit more patience, a little bit more deference, a little bit more letting people in to the line instead of crowding right up to the person's bumper who's right in front of you. Um, maybe a little bit of glorification of God would happen. What would it be like? How would it change our attitude? How would it change our, uh, uh, the, the excellence of our work product? How would it change the influence, the, the kind of thing we project, the picture we project to our neighbors if we started raking leaves and cutting grass and pulling uh, weeds in Jesus' name? To the glory of God, I do this King Jesus who died for me as unto you. I do this as unto, not as a man pleaser, not because the association is going to find me, not because my spouse is going to get on my case if I don't get this. I'm offering this up as a living sacrifice to you. What it, what would it, how would it change if we began to change diapers, to wash dishes, to do laundry, to clean toilets and offer that up as a sacrifice to the king of the universe. I had a transformational experience one day. Um, you guys can stop listening for the next three minutes. I had a transformational experience one day when I was babysitting my grandson who had completed a glorious bowel movement in his diaper. And as I was bending over the bed and I was trying to get it all cleaned up and I was on my, about my fourth wet wipe, you know what I'm talking about, folks? Um, and I was, I was making faces and I was waving the, the fragrant aroma, you know? And he was just a, a nonverbal baby looking up and with looks of concern and what's wrong with you, Papa? I'm, I, don't, I'm, I don't know about you, I'm dying up here, you know? And, and, and it hit me, I, I teach this stuff. I preach this stuff, I believe this stuff. And, and, and I realized, here's an opportunity for me to glorify God in this moment. In this act, very perfunctory, just had to be done, but you can either just go through the motions or you can do it as unto the Lord. In that moment, I was faced with a decision. Kind of, sort of like y'all are today, not meaning to put anybody on the spot, okay? But um, I decided I am going to do this as unto you. Your word commands it. I am going to do it, and we'll see where we go from there. Sure can't get any worse, <laughs> okay? So I begin to just worship God. I just begin, Lord, I do this as unto you. I thank you for the privilege of serving this little one who can do nothing to return the favor. I do this as unto him because he needs it done. I do this because I am becoming like you became, a servant, and washed the feet of your disciples. I decided that I would do that. Suddenly, my attitude my attitude before his, my attitude changed. And I got a smile on my face and I began to worship and I began to sing and I began to talk to him and he began to coo back at me and to smile back at me and to reach his little arms up at me. It changed, it changed the situation. And if you can, if that can happen with poo poo, that can happen with anything in your life. Please don't go home and tell your neighbors what you heard at church this morning. <laughs> but that's the reality of the situation. It will change the realities of our situations. It'll change the mediocre moments, the drudgery moments, the mundane moments into incredible opportunities to offer this as worship back to God, serving other people and offering that up as worship to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. I wonder if it would change what or how much we ate if we ap approached mealtime as this is, an, this is a sacrifice of praise. This is an offering of worship. This is a, this is a dying to self and an act of obedience. And I think the answer is yes. Uh, would it change how we use money, what we spend, what we invest, what we save, 
I think it would. Lord, I'm doing this as unto you and asking you to bless it as I submit it to your lordship. What if we begin to look at our workbench at work, our library, our dorm room, our office desk, our draftsman's table, our lathe, our kitchen stove, or our computer terminal as an altar before which we stand and we minister God through us to the rest of our world, to first of all to everybody that we have an opportunity to impact personally, our personal sphere of influence, and then as that ripple effect takes place, it's changing the world from the altar of my computer terminal. Is that possible? And the answer is yes. Final answer? Yes. It's absolutely possible. If we start seeing all of life as potential acts of worship, there is no telling the kind of transformational power that can be unleashed into our lives by the God who called us to that. When we watch TV, can we do that to the glory of God? What about news reports like the one we just got about the officers in Baton Rouge? What, did, what happened there? Even a bad, dreary news report moved us to a point of prayer, right? And in that moment, even with bad news, we had an opportunity to sanctify that moment and worship God. How about if we heard, on, if we watched on TV and there was great drama, good writing, excellent acting, or maybe a um, comedian that really made us laugh, bring our hair down, decompress, and we really enjoyed that. How would you sanctify that moment? How about by giving thanks that God equipped or that gifted people like that and that he's given me a brain sharp enough to get the joke and laugh um, and, and enjoy it. I, gave, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Yeah, that's all a part of that. Is it possible even to sleep, to nap, to rest, to do acts of recreation, even to go on vacation to the glory of God? And the answer is yes. So how do you do that? How, what would that look like? Oh God, I'm thanking you for keeping us safe as we drive to the lake. Oh Lord, I thank you that you've blessed me with the money to buy this boat I'm dragging behind. Oh Lord, I'm thankful that you've given us healthy bodies that we can get out there and water ski or that we can fish or hunt or whatever it is that you do for, for recreation. Oh Lord, I praise you that uh, I'm able to still hold this bat in my decrepit fingers and hit home runs to the glory of God. Whatever it is, but it's got to be intentional. It can't just be, we can no longer go through life on cruise control. Putting it in neutral and just kind of dummying it through life is not going to get it. It has to be done with intention. Now, um, the result of this is that whether you're doing homework or you're serving, doing something to serve your spouse or you're jogging, you're ironing clothes or whatever, everything has the capacity to become an act of worship to God. It's no longer done just to keep your boss off your back or stay out of trouble with your spouse or, you know, because the uh, neighborhood association is going to fine you. It's not just to draw a paycheck. It's not just to get ahead of your coworkers, to get the promotion, to get a pay raise or whatever. Instead, it becomes, I don't do this as men pleasers. The Bible teaches against that. This is done as unto the Lord. I'm trusting you to bless it. Make me a signpost as a result of the way I live my life. Yeah, I invite the scrutiny. Let my coworkers watch my life. Watch me outperform. Watch me outproduce. Watch my quality go up. Watch my witness match what I say. My life witness match what I say with my words. And watch evangelism take place in your home, in your neighborhood, and in your workplace. That's real. That's real. It shouldn't be one message coming out of our mouth and another one coming out of our life. They should match. Each act, each thought, each conversation, opportunity to glorify God. An opportunity to glorify God. This means that everything in our life, the mon most mundane chore, the most unloved loved task at work, uh, can bring fulfillment, have meaning. Bring, we can have more peace in our lives. We don't just hurry through things because we, there's something else more important. No, there's nothing more important than what we're doing right now because this is an act, can be an act of worship to glorify God. This is going to also, ladies and gentlemen, 
completely revolutionize corporate worship. When we do that half an hour on Sunday morning, gather together with our brothers and sisters, and we're lifting our voices and our hands in worship to God, what, wouldn't that be empowered? Wouldn't that be um, radicalized if we, instead of using that time to get in tune with God, were walking in tune with the will of God, the intentions of God as priests and offering constantly offering up sacrifices all week long, it would be an explosion of corporate worship. So I'm not denigrating the importance of music or of, of song or of words or of together, worship together. I'm saying that if we lived our entire week like that, think of what that half an hour could be transformed into when we do worship together with music and corporately. So is it possible to live all of life as worship? The answer is yes, it is. Is it possible for all of us to function as priests of the Most High God regardless of what your personal altar happens to look like? Could be a sink with dirty dishes in it. That's your altar. Hallelujah. God can be glorified in those moments. Is it possible to live life that way? And the answer is absolutely. Otherwise, God wouldn't have commanded it, not in one passage, but in two scriptures to two different churches. But it's just like everything that God calls us to. Look, I'm not here to put one more thing on your plate today. I know you're busy people. I know you've got lots of balls to juggle. You've got all kinds of plates spinning around on Ted Mack's amateur hour. Remember old folks? Okay? I know you've got lots of things going on in your life. If I just told you, look, hey, you got to buck up. you got to suck up. you got to make this thing happen. All of life is worship, constant 24-7 priests. Okay, I guess that's just one more thing I've got to take care of. I didn't know I had to. Sorry I went to church this morning. <laughs> no, here's the good news. Everything that God calls us to, God wants to empower us to do, to perform. He's not calling on you through me and through this message to just suck it up and make it happen. He's not saying, okay, well, you just got to develop more willpower. You just got to develop more self-discipline. You've just got to pull yourself every day up by your own bootstraps and get out there and make that kind of life happen on your own because that's not the way God rolls either. Everything God calls us to, parenthood, a particular job, uh, some responsibility in the church, a Sunday school teacher, a royal ranger, everything God calls us to, he wants to empower us. He needs to empower us, otherwise we get re weary really quickly. So the good news is this, the God who's just called you to life, a full-time life as priests, and a full-time life of glorifying, worshiping God, is a God who wants to empower you to live that way. This is not on your shekel. This is not up to you to just make that happen by your own ingenuity, creativity, and good looks. This is something that God wants to empower you through the work of His Holy Spirit in your life to accomplish. So, ask and receive. Seek and find. Knock and the door will be open to you. I know, God, now that you've called me to live this kind of life. Now I'm asking you. I can't do it on my own. This is not within me. This is not within the frail, fallen humanity that I'm a part of. I'm opening up to you, and I'm asking you to do a transformative work, to do an empowering work in my life, to enable me to walk into this next level uh, of growth and service to you. Now, as we go to prayer, I'm going to list a number of very specific prayer requests and some of you are going to want to pray one, some all, and some maybe two or three of these prayer requests, but they are very specific. They all connect to this message. If you have sensed a, um, a call to this kind of lifestyle, then these are the kinds of prayers that you might want to pray. Oh God, please expand my idea of what worship is. Help me to understand, God, that it's more than just verbal praise. Others might want to pray this. Lord, help me to be more intentional about my everyday life. Instead of just bumbling mindlessly through my responsibilities of the day, help me to see every act, every deed, every communication between me and others as an opportunity to glorify you in my life. Others might want to 
to ask this. Lord, help me to no longer be satisfied by just getting by, just making it by the skin of my teeth, just barely getting through, um, just fulfilling minimum requirements. Lord, help me be a person of excellence. Help excellence be a, a, an earmark of my life. Help my life to exude the kind of excellence that we see in you as a divine being. Help me live that kind of life that's exemplary and that points the way to you. Here's another prayer that you might want to pray. Lord, I covenant to do everything as unto you. I'm, I covenant to do all things as unto you. Can you then have a demeaning argument with your spouse? Eh, it's not really possible, not as unto the Lord. Lord, I want you to break down barriers in my life that I or that society or that my role models in the past have erected that says this part is the secular part of my life and this is the sacred part of my life. This is the really, this is the worshipful, this is the part where I connect with God. Instead, Lord, help me in all my ways to acknowledge you with everything that is within me, with all of my heart, with all my soul, and with all of my strength. And then the last thing has to do with this business of, of empowerment. And I would just say, if, you're, if you try to do this on your own, God bless you. You're going to need it because you are going to, you're going to become frustrated. You're going to become discouraged and you're going to become weary. God did not call you to this this morning for you to do this on your own. He simply didn't. If you could do this on your own, guess who gets the credit at the end of the day? you you get the credit God's called you to this and now he's saying and everything I call you to I will provide I will enable I will infuse you with my divine power and you will be doing this in the strength that I give you not in your own strength so some of you are going to are going to be needing to pray this prayer Lord I want this in my life. I want that abundant life Jesus said he came to bring. I want to be your 24-7 priest. I want to live all of life as worship. Here's the way that you do it. God, fill me. Empower me. Send your divine enablement because within me dwells no good thing. That's Paul too. Can't do it on my own. Give me a vision and then fill me with your power to live all of life as worship as your priest, touching everybody in my sphere of influence.